here. Uh, recording in progress. Got it. Where'd Greg go? We lost Greg. Oh, he's, he's okay. He's, 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 he's getting stuff ready. All right, Brad, you want to kick it off? You want me to? Uh, go ahead. All right, welcome. Uh, Purple Martin Fanatics, tonight is our part two of uh, air gun recommendations and shooting techniques. Thank you for joining us. We're the Purple Martin Fanatics group on Facebook and your admins here are myself, Kathy Freeze, Brad Biddle, Courtney Russo, and Tammy, where'd Tammy go? Oh, there's Tammy, she's over in the right corner. Hey, Tammy, Tammy Seaman. Um, so if you have any questions tonight, please post them in the chat. Greg Ballard is our host. He is our air gun expert, and he is going to teach us tonight about uh, scope mounting procedures and uh, the shooting process, and he will address your questions. Um, I think last time, Brad, you muted everybody, and if they had a question, you can raise your I'm hand, or put it in the chat, and Courtney will uh, make sure that uh, Greg addresses it for you. Do you want to do that again tonight? Since we have fewer people, or just try it without it first. It doesn't matter to me. Um, yeah, just just raise your hand and and uh, or put it in chat, whichever one way you're more comfortable. It do, doesn't really okay. matter. We don't have as many people tonight, so okay. Um, Brad, you have anything else? All right, it, Greg. We got to learn how to kill stuff. <laughs> Greg, I'm, it's all yours. To, uh, sorry, go ahead, oh, Courtney. Um. Do we want to talk about um, our time frame for the evening? Yeah, last so we time we kind of ran over. <laughs> yeah. So what's the time frame for the evening? We'll try to keep it to a, mo no more than an hour. Yeah. So at 740. This one will go quicker once, once we get going anyway. Okay. Right. Perfect. Right. Thank it's, you, Courtney. This part okay, is not Greg. complicated. This part is not as complicated as some people make it out. All right. It's all yours. Take it away, Greg. Okay, I was going to start off uh, talking about scopes uh, because I think a lot of people make an error when they get a air gun of, of purchasing the wrong kind of scope for the air gun and then they are not very accurate and it's not the gun as much as it's the scope has broken. Uh, so any of the types of air rifles that you buy uh, that have like a brake barrel or a side cocking or an under cocking, uh, the springers, spring piston guns, uh, those have a, a tendency to break rifle scopes. So you need to make sure even on the non uh, springer type rifles that, that you just go ahead and get an air rifle rated scope. So you can get uh, lots of different brands of those and uh, from all kinds of price points from under a hundred dollars to hundred dollars. Uh, so uh, center point leapers, UTG uh, are some pretty good ones. Hawks are excellent there and they're all air gun rated uh, so that they're not going to just break uh, just because you're shooting the air rifle and it has a backward recoil. And can you say, so can you say those brands again? Yeah, UTG is a brand. Uh, Leapers is a brand. Uh, you have Centerpoint and Hawk are, are four of the top ones. The Hawks are the, the more expensive of the lot. Uh, I actually have a Centerpoint on my Marauder. It's been on there since I've had that rifle and it's never failed. Uh, so it's a pretty good one as well. Uh, the Marauder is a PCP rifle, so it doesn't have any recoil. So you could get away with a regular rifle scope for it if you really wanted to. If you already had one laying around, uh, you could actually use that on down since it doesn't have any recoil at all. But the uh, barrel, uh, the ones where you cock the barrel down or the side and stuff, those will tear up a regular rifle scope. And it doesn't even matter if it's a $3,000 rifle scope, it'll break it. Uh, so if you have any of those, then for sure get an air rifle rated scope and uh, it doesn't hurt to get one anyway. And so some things on a scope that I kind of consider important for air gun shooting. One of them is to have a side focus on the rifle scope. So the center points and the leapers and such, they do have models that side focus 
that'll be a knob that sits on the right hand side of the scope that you can turn in small increments that will adjust the focus on your target. Uh, eliminates the parallax on the target and brings the target into focus. Uh, some of the higher end scopes like the Hawk, uh, the See if you can see this one. This is a side focus wheel here, and it, it allows me to fine tune my focus to the point where I can actually use it like a rangefinder. Uh, so I can mark the dial, and when something comes in perfect focus for me, I can actually tell how far off it is uh, just by knowing that it's in focus at that uh, distance. Wow. Uh, so that's something that I consider to be very important. It's the ability to eliminate your, your parallax. What a parallax will do in a scope is if you get your face behind a scope and you move your head side to side like this, if your target's moving around, then you have a parallax at that distance. And that means that you're going to be less accurate when you shoot because unless you're perfectly centered behind that from shot to shot to shot the same way you was the previous shot, then your uh, image relative to, to where it's actually at will be different and you'll actually shoot off in a bigger group and such only because that your uh, parallax is not set properly. So that allows you to set that uh, to where when you wiggle your head around slightly side to side, the image that you're looking at doesn't move. So your crosshair stays steady and the image doesn't move. Uh, so that's something that I look for. Uh, you'll also probably want to get a, an adjustable power scope. Uh, so they do make still fixed power scopes, but they're fairly rare these days. So you'll need to get a fixed power scope so you can adjust it from a low power to a higher power. Uh, if you're not shooting very far, uh, then a three to nine or a four to 12 scope is plenty uh, for you. And uh, if you're having to shoot a little bit further then uh, four to 16 is typically what I go with. And you'll want to, to get a fairly large objective and that that's the far end the closest to the tip of the barrel. Uh, down at the end, you'll want to get one of those that's uh, fairly sizable and not too small. That allows you to get on target quicker. It has a wider uh, field of view and uh, it allows more light to come through the scope. So if you're having to shoot at uh, close to daylight or, or closer to dark, uh, then you can still see uh, quite well uh, with that. Uh, you may find that you need to adjust your power down some uh, so that the uh, diopter of, of the scope uh, can match the maximum amount of light that your eye can receive. So uh, 40, 44, 50, those are some common ones. Uh, a lot of times when you get an a air gun kit, it'll come with a scope. And I usually recommend that people don't ever do that. And they just go ahead and just get the rifle by itself and then buy the scope separate because they generally put uh, very low end scopes and put some that are only like 32 millimeters on the end and such on their rifles to save cost. So uh, I think a person should in invest pretty much as much on the scope as they do in their rifle, if not more, uh, because uh, of, of obvious reasons of, of integrity. And if you can't hit it and you can't see it, you can't hit it. And if your scope doesn't stay zero, then you're gonna be very frustrated uh, on that. Uh, so, there's also choices on scopes uh, between uh, the turrets or, or the things that sit on the top and on the right hand side that adjust your scope uh, impacts up and down and right and left. So you can get those that have caps on them <clears throat> and the pros and cons of that, the cap things, once you put them in and get it zero and you put the caps back on there, then you can't accidentally turn, turn the dial and it'll, it'll stay in its place. But it's a lot easier to use the ones that have the exposed turrets, like this hawk, where I can just grab the scope and twist it here. Uh, so the hawks here also can lock in place if you want to, it's got a little knob on top and you can actually set it in place and then lock it here. And now you cannot accidentally turn it. So here you can do that and unlock it and then I can click it and then you can come back down, lock it in place, and then you can't move it. So, so I recommend to, to have the exposed turrets. 
uh, on there. So the only time I've ever ran into issues using the exposed turrets is like when I was shooting some long, uh, long range rifle matches and such. Uh, if you sling carry your rifle and you're having to run or anything like that, you can actually dial the scope with your leg as you're, as you're running or, or walking fast. Uh, so you have to be really, really careful about that. So all of these scopes that have the exposed turrets and stuff also have uh, zeros on them so that you can turn it to zero. You can set the turret at zero once it is zeroed and you can just glance at it each time and you'll know that it's been moved if it's not still on zero for you. Uh, you're going to have to make a choice on the type of scope uh, increments that uh, each of the little clicks of the scope makes. Uh, you got three different kinds that they're offer. You got a mil, which is short for milliradian, and you got an MOA, and then you got regular inches. So uh, all the scopes will come with one of those types of adjustments. So they'll they'll be either like a quarter a quarter MOA, or there'll be a one eighth MOA, or there'll be a one tenth of a mil click, or they'll they'll be you know an inch, eighth of an inch click. So they'll have some kind of a value associated with uh, how much of a movement each click of that scope will, will change. So you need to pay really good attention to, to that because that's how you're gonna know how, how many clicks it takes to move that bullet to where you need it to go. So, uh, so for, those, are all, those are all distances at 100 yards. Yeah, they're distances at any yards. So an MOA is an MOA at any yardage. Well, I'm uh, talking about the quarter inch, like the ones that are yeah, quarter that's inch at 100 yards. yards. Yeah, yeah. That's, they're always set them at 100, even on the air rifle scope. Uh, so you gotta keep that in mind too, uh, because if you're at 25 yards, uh, then it's gonna take you four times more clicks than it would if you right. were trying to adjust it at 100 yards. So you do have to keep that in mind uh, if you're counting clicks uh, to, to adjust it at target distance that you're doing. So. Uh, yeah, they're all they're all like that. Uh, An MOA is pretty close to an inch at 100 yards, uh, so you can always think of it as an inch at 100 yards. And then you're doing a quarter MOA is the most common click increment on a scope. So quarter inch each click. So if you're just an inch off of your target, you put four clicks in at 100 yards and you're okay. Or you got to put 16 clicks in it if you're up closer at 25 yards uh, to get to get closer to target. So those are the things you have to, to think about. Uh, you also find uh, the reticles in the scopes. You can, there's such a huge variety of reticles that are in scopes these days. Uh, I suggest that people get just a regular mill dot reticle inside of there. One of the things that'll happen a lot of times, which it's not gonna affect uh, what we're doing with these uh, scopes much is that you'll find that you have a mill dot which is in mills, and then they put MOA as the adjustment on the knobs that you turn. So it's not in the, in the same uh, measurement spec. So then uh, if you were actually using that for range finding and distance shooting, like you would if you were like a military sniper or police sniper type person, you uh, would have to do the math as to how many clicks do I need to do an MOA to uh, account for this in mills. Uh, so uh, if you're we're shooting like that or shooting long range, then I would suggest to always get the cl click increments on the scope to match the reticle. So if you have an MOA reticle, get you an MOA knob. If it's a mill reticle, get you a mill knob uh, so that they match each other, uh, just in case you ever, ever want to do that. Uh, you will need to purchase uh, a set of rings that match the scope. So... The uh, diameters of, of or can be like one inch or 30 millimeter. It's the two most common things that you'll see. So you need to get uh, your rings that has the same diameter as the scope that you got. So like my uh, hawk here is a 30 millimeter uh, tube. And so I got to have 30 millimeter rings uh, to, go, to go with it. Uh, so you have to take that and then you'll have a choice of height on those so you can get low medium high extra high rings uh, you will need uh, to have possibly ask somebody if you don't know for sure which ones uh, are going to be uh, right for you 
uh, if you don't have anybody that you can ask that can know or whatever, then always choose medium or highs and you'll be safe on most all of your rifles. Uh, so low sometimes will be too low and they'll hit the barrel uh, with the objective and uh, then you'll have to send them back and get a, another set on that. Uh, bases for air rifles, that's the part that, that mounts to the air rifle and then you mount the rings to it. Uh, on most air rifles, it has like a dovetail type of an attachment on the top of the air rifle and it's 11 millimeters wide. So most of your rifle scope bases and stuff that you get that are at Walmart or at a sporting goods store like Cabela's will, will not fit that. So they're not 11 millimeters. So you need to make sure that when you go to buy some, you get some that are specific 11 millimeter. And I would suggest to go to like Pyramid Air or Air Gun Depot, uh, Air Guns of Arizona or someplace like that and get you an air gun specific uh, base or rings. And some air rifles will also allow you to get an adapter that'll go from 11 millimeter to a Picatinny. And a Picatinny uh, allows you to mount uh, regular scope rings on, on it because it's a, more of a standard rifle size. Uh, that's what I chose on here. So on, on this gun here, I have a 11 millimeter to a Picatinny, and it also has a 20 minute of angle adjustment on the scope base, which tilts my scope down just a little bit further, which allows me to shoot further. Uh, so with this gun here, I can shoot an, an awful long ways for an air rifle. And uh, so, but that allows me to be able to adjust the scope uh, so I don't run out of elevation because of, uh, of that. Any questions on any of that? Uh, you, the only thing I would throw in there is don't, you know, I don't have any scopes that cost as much as my rifles. I have some scopes that cost half as much or more than half as much, and they work well for me, but on the rings, don't cheap out on your rings. I, don't buy see-through rings. They, you, those are common at Walmart. You don't want the you don't want the uh, scope that far off the barrel because your cheek weld. You're not going to have a cheek weld. And also, I buy. I always try to buy steel rings. Uh, you can buy aluminum ones and you can buy steel ones. And I'm rough on everything I own. And I will, if I have aluminum rings on a rifle, I will knock the scope off every time so the zero yeah. not, I'm not knock the actual scope off yeah i'm backwards i usually buy aluminum rings uh myself so i'm just a little bit different than that so most of mine are aluminum kyle uh, shepherd has a question yeah hey uh so we were talking about um eighth and quarter inch moa increments uh for siding in your scope at 100 yards but that also means that it's going to be twice as much at half the distance, right? Yes. So, right. Uh, I don't know about anybody here, but most of the shots that I take are well within 100 yards. Uh, yes. So just something to think about if you're you know, going with adjustments that could be fairly big at 25 or 50 yards. Yeah, if you're going to try adjusting. But in most people's cases, they don't have you know 60 or 70 yards worth of birdhouses like I do. Fair. <laughs> <laughs> they have a house or two and they only need to worry about adjusting the scope that that one time and then checking it from time to time so you only have to adjust it around a lot once and then you're after that you're, your gun may be off uh, temperature or something couldn't make it off a little bit but it's not going to be off so much that you're going to have to you know turn that knob an entire revolution or anything to get back on target unless you were to like drop it if you see a change like that on a gun the scope is probably broken uh, so uh, they just don't, they don't move that much after you get them set unless they're broken or somebody's dropped them. Something, something drastic has happened. So even, even the extremes of temperature from summertime to wintertime, it's not that great. It's not that great. It's usually just a few inches at most. Do you use Loctite to, to mount your scopes? Do I? Do you use Loctite to mount your scopes? No. Really? Do not lock tight my scopes. Uh, I've had more issues with lock 
Loctiting scope rings than I've ever had without. So no, I don't Loctite anything. Okay. So I just uh, put it in like it is and torque it to the proper value. Uh, so when you talk about that, when you mount the scope in the rings, the first thing you'll do is put your scope into the rings, uh, kind of center the turrets in between the two ring halves there. You'll put the caps back on top of it and you'll tighten down the screws, but not all the way. You'll just tighten them down to where it's just barely holding the scope. And that's where you're going to start your uh, scope setting from. Uh, so you're going to set it there. So you got two things that you need to worry about mostly on, on three things, I guess, that, that you got to worry about with the scope when you're mounting it. So the first thing is that you get uh, your cheek weld and your eye in the perfect location. So on the gun, when you cheek up on the gun, you're not trying to squeeze it into your body really hard or anything. You want to just lay your cheek on, just lay it there. And it should bump right up against your cheekbone right here. And what I typically always do is I'll get in there and I'll, I'll put the butt stock into my shoulder lightly. And then I'll lay my face with the cheek right on the stock with my eyes closed till I feel comfortable. And this is the way that I want to shoot. And then I will open my eyes. And when I do that, I should see a perfect circle through that scope. I should see the crosshair. I should see a complete full circle, no shadowing around the edges or any of that. If I have any of that, then my scope is, is too high or too low for me. So I will adjust either the, I got adjustable stocks on a lot of my rifles and I can adjust the, the cheek up and down. You can actually mount something on the back if you need to raise your cheek up a little bit uh, or you can get different rings that are lower or higher. But you do not want to move your face at all once uh, on the gun. To be a natural thing to where when you lay it there, you just open your eyes and you can see. Uh, so that will be uh, one thing there. And you may have to adjust the scope back towards your face or away from your face as well. Uh, so you got an eye relief that's usually about three inches long that you're looking through. And, and that changes based on the power that you're setting the scope. So if you have a scope set on a higher power, lower power, you'll actually have a little bit of an eye uh, relief difference when you do that. So those are the two major things that you need to get is the up and down to where it's right in front of your eye and forwards and backwards to when you open your eyes, everything is clear and you do not have to move your head to see through your scope perfectly well. So that takes some work, uh, and, but it's the, one of the most beneficial things of, of sighting a gun is, is to actually get that perfectly right for you. Uh, so you do not want to have to adapt to the gun. You make the gun adapt to you. So uh, those things are helpful. You can get, uh, like this gun here doesn't have anything on the back, but it, it fits me perfectly well, even without it. But this gun does not. So I have an adjustable butt piece on here, cheek piece that raises my cheek up higher so that I can see through that scope perfectly well without having to make any head movements. Great. Can we pause for just one second here? Yep. Uh, so I found a pin feature where I pinned Greg to the to the biggest picture. Can everyone else see the bit him in a bigger picture now? I was until you started talking and then you went to the big picture. Okay, but while he's talking, he is in the bigger picture. On my screen, yes. So that's gonna change depending on who's recording it and what your settings are. So if you're recording it and you've got him pinned, then that's the way it'll show for everybody in the YouTube video. Okay, the reason I'm asking this is because Greg, if you wouldn't mind, the things that you just talked about, uh, the turrets, the, the rings and the parts of the scope and everything, if you could do me a favor and hold your gun up that has those and just point to those different parts on your scope uh, just a real quick run through. I don't, you don't have to repeat everything, but just point to the different parts that you talked about, if you wouldn't mind. 
Okay, can you see me well? Uh, I need you to back up just a little more so we can see the rest of your scope. I was holding it up right. That's perfect. There you go. Yes. Okay. So on a scope on the left-hand side is a knob. This is your parallax or your focus on your target. When you turn this, your target will get sharper into focus or, or worse. You wanna turn it forward and backwards until your target is in clear focus. And that eliminates the parallax, everything is good. And if you wiggle your head just a little bit on there, it's not gonna make your shot uh, be affected some that. So on the top of the scope, here is your elevation. This is what moves your bullet impacts up and down. And pretty much every scope in the world has it to where if you go counterclockwise, like this counterclockwise, then that will move the bullet impact up. And then over here on the right hand side will be your left and your right. They call it a windage, elevation and windage. On again, on almost every scope, if you pull back towards you, that moves the bullet impact to the right. So this is to the right and this one is up. So back towards you to the right and counterclockwise is up. So those are the turrets. Those are the turrets. And these are exposed turrets because I just grab them and turn them. So they're exposed. And this is a, a vortex scope. And on the back side here is where you can tell what level of elevation you're at and you can have it set. If you uh, have it there, you can adjust uh, the thing to where you can set it back to zero. So when they talk about zeroing a scope, that's really what they're talking about. You got it sighted in and then you zero it. So uh, that's what the zeroing part actually means. So uh, you can set your, your scope turrets back to zero and then you can adjust them and then you can bring it back to zero and you don't have to count. So you can do it really, really fast. One at the scope rings. Yeah. Scope rings. Oh, okay. This part here. These are extremely good scope rings here. Uh, they have six screws torque screws on the top. Generally, the ones that are the best will have six and they'll be wide. Uh, and so there's two halves to them. You got a bottom half, which actually has a piece on the here that you will screw onto your base. So that you'll tighten this up onto your base. You can move it forwards and backwards on the rail here, which is the base, the rail. This is that picketing I was talking about. It has slots cut in it so that when your scope goes across uh, those slots, it really locks it in place and it can't move forwards and backwards. So if you were just to clamp it onto just a rail by itself, like on most air rifles, the scope can actually move forwards and backwards if you were to bump it because it's only squeezing uh, by friction. And if you tighten it too much, then it bends the rails. So uh, picatinny rails like this doesn't allow that. So the boat that actually squeezes it down fits inside of the Picatinny rail slots and locks the scope in place. So very secure uh, means of mounting and uh, six screws is better than four on the top. And so when I go to mount this here, I'll put it in here, I'll screw this down until this doesn't wiggle. This doesn't wiggle around. I can pull it, slide it forwards and backwards uh, until this uh, is where I want to see through it. So it's just the right distance away from my eyeball that I can see through it well. And then I'll cheek up on this part here with my eyes closed, nice and lightly. And then I'll open my eyes and I should be seeing through that scope perfectly well without having to move anything. And if I'm not, then I want to adjust the gun, not me. So don't, don't find yourself cheeking up and, and doing this number here if you're doing that, you're not going to be accurate. So you should not move. So you get yourself comfortable and make the gun fit you. So whether it requires you adding uh, something to it, uh, cutting the stock off, like uh, Brad talks about doing, uh, taking sandpaper to it, whatever it takes uh, to make the gun fit you. Uh, typically, the up and down part will always usually be your rings. You need to go up or down uh, on your ring height. So you may have, if you were uh, uh, extra higher rings, you may need to go to a higher or medium uh, ring to, to move it down. So always do that. That's probably one of the most critical parts of it all. 
is is to make sure that this scope is back and perfectly high. So it's up and down that's the hardest part. The back and forth, you can just uh, loosen it and adjust it back and forth to fit your eye relief. But your cheek weld is very, very important. And uh, pretty much every single high-end uh, precision rifle, especially everyone I've ever shot in my life, uh, has an adjustable cheek piece on it just for that reason. Uh, and most of them also have an adjustable length of pull. So instead of cutting your stock off, you just adjust the back end as well. So, uh, or if you buy a cheap, or if you buy that, a cheap Walmart gun, you just cut it off. Yeah, just cut it off. All. It don't matter. You get a sawzall and a Dremel tool and get after it. So Greg, uh, uh, you've mounted your scope. Uh, yep. I, think, I think we covered all of that. Not, so, not all of it. There's not one, all of it. One yet? other thing you have to do. Okay. Is good. Level or level your reticle. So you need to level your reticle. So when you look through it and everything is nice and round, you should have a reticle that's straight up and down through the, through the scope. So if your rifle's sitting there and it's nice and level, it's not leaning to one side or the other, your crosshair should be perfectly vertical inside of there. For what we're doing, that's not the absolute critical thing in the world because we're not shooting a thousand yards. Uh, so uh, if you get close, you're good enough. And some people actually have a natural cant and their uh, scope hairs will actually be crooked, but it's straight to them. <laughs> uh, so uh, on that, oh, this piece back here on the back, this is an ocular adjustment. Some people think this is what you use to, to adjust the focus on the target, but it is not. So you do not, you do not look at your target when you adjust this. So you can turn this one forward and backwards too. This is to clarify your reticle. So what you do here is you'll look at something like a bright white wall or the sky, and you'll adjust this until the crosshair is the darkest. Oh, cool. And then you just leave it be. So that adjusts it to your eye. Uh, so uh, that's for a reticle adjustment on clarity. And the one on the side, and sometimes they're on the end down here, is what adjusts your focus on the target. So uh, some people kind of get those messed up. But that's what that is. Uh, this one has an illuminated reticle too. That's what this knob here on the back is. So I can turn this knob and the uh, crosshairs inside will light up uh, different, different intensities. So, and this knob back here, that's how you adjust your power. So from the low power to the high power. Uh, so, and that pretty much covers the scope. Okay, so question. When you are uh, signing it in, so now you want to put a few pellets through it and see how far off you are, right? How many pellets would you recommend that somebody shoot uh, at a time before they adjust their scope? So my husband, okay. I'll, I'll, ask, I'll tell you why I yeah. ask this. My husband tells me, always put three pellets through, then adjust your scope. Yeah. Uh, it depends on how good of a shooter you are. <laughs> To be honest with you, if you're an average shooter or you don't have a whole lot of experience, that three pellet rule is, is, is definitely there, uh, maybe even more. Uh, but for me, I'm usually shooting one, and my second one's going to be pretty much on target. Uh, I'll show you why in okay. a bit. Okay. Uh, so if this is a brand new thing, you got a brand new gun, and you got a brand new scope, how in the world are you going to get it to where you can actually hit your target? Right. So that's that's the thing that 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 people struggle with quite a bit and they really don't need to. There's two options. I actually don't use this as often as I'm going to act like I do. But this is a pretty handy little tool right here. This is a laser bore sighter. So this little device here has a capability to fit in multiple calibers by changing the tips out on this end. And you slide it into your barrel nice and tight. You turn it on and it will project the laser beam down range and onto the target. And then once you do that, all you do is dial your scope until it's on the red dot. And then your first shot's gonna be on paper. So these are about, now you can get them $35 or something like that. If you shoot a lot, it's probably worth having one around. Other That's than that, cool. yeah. <laughs> Other than that, the best thing to do is use a big target and shoot close. So I suggest that people get them a big piece of cardboard, like a big Amazon box or something like that and open it up pretty big. A big piece of coral plast or something you can get a poster board from Walmart 
Uh, it's like less than a dollar for one of those. And they're like three foot tall and two foot wide. So they're pretty big and shoot at 10 yards. So you can eyeball at 10 yards and hit that. Uh, so you can just kind of lean down and look down your barrel and hit that target at 10 yards. It's, it's kind of like pointing your finger at it. So you should be able to hit that target. If you can hit that target, you'll be on target within just a few shots. I can, I can guarantee it. So first important thing is hitting the target. So, but if you do that with a big, a big target and close, and it doesn't matter if you're 10 yards and you're going to actually end up sighting in at 25, 30, 40 yards, doesn't matter. You start at 10 yards and then you'll be on at 40 yards. Uh, if you're on at 10, you'll, you'll be on at 40 as well. So you'll have to adjust, but you'll be there. So cool. And you'll see, you might not have to adjust as much as you think. So that's a, uh, uh, laser bore siders, uh, not too awfully expensive. They are not, people think that you put these in there and that's all you got to do. I know so many people that bore sight their gun with the laser and they never shoot it and then go hunting. And then, oh, I don't know what happened. Well, you know, if you set that thing in there crooked, you're going to be 10 foot off, you know, your laser points in a straight line, but if you don't have it squirt, so always shoot to verify but there's a lot of people that do not they get the idea that this here is the cure-all it is not uh, a cure-all so that that's a, a tool uh on that okay so so one of the things that when you're starting to shoot your gun uh you need to have some kind of a rest to shoot off of this can be fancy like this rest here that we showed the other day, this Caldwell rest, which is a tripod rest. Mm -hmm. It holds the rifle in two uh, parts at the front and the back, so it cradles it well. It holds the gun for you so you don't have to use your muscles to hold it. Uh, so it works pretty good. This is what I typically use when I'm sitting out here shooting at fat starlings and stuff. It's, it's this, because it just holds the gun. I can just sit here and watch the birds and hopefully never have to shoot nothing. So, uh, but that one's pretty good. And there's just a huge variety of shooting bags, such as this one. You can see this one's a really nice one. It has a, a V cut in it so that your rifle can uh, ride inside the slot and it can't move side to side. Uh, so some shooting bags, if you have them, if you don't, uh, you can use rolled up towels. So you can take a big towel and roll it up into a circle and shoot off of the top of it, uh, something similar to that. You can put it on a box with a rolled up towel in there. You do not want to side in a rifle in a clamp. So you see a lot of these shooting devices and stuff like that. You do not want to do that. So you don't want to lock the gun down when you're siding it in. You want it to be able to move. Uh, so. I shoot and something with the air rifle, especially, uh, I shoot a really loose hold. Some people call it an artillery type hold, but I don't squeeze the gun. And most times I'm shooting it just with one arm. I've not even got my left arm on the gun at all. So I'm shooting it just one handed and I'm not putting my body weight or anything into it. So I just shoot, I let the gun do what it's gonna do. So if you give it an opportunity, it will move in the bags and it'll, it'll move the same way each time if you're not squeezing it differently each time that you shoot it. So if you let the gun do its thing, it'll try to do the same thing every time and it'll make it more accurate. Uh, so that's important to do. Uh, uh, trigger discipline. Uh, so I was talking about this the other day. You don't wanna put the very tip of your finger on the trigger. That's a very sensitive part of your finger. You wanna move it backwards towards the crack in your finger so that it's less sensitive and that kind of separates out the mind from the trigger pull. So you don't want to think about the trigger pull. You just want the trigger pull to happen. So if you get to thinking about the trigger pull and you get to thinking about when the gun is going to go off, you will end up developing something called target panic and you will get to where you anticipate the shot to where you, your mind gets so efficient at shooting. And you even get close to the, the bullseye or close to whatever you're starting you're shooting, you'll just jerk the trigger back and shoot and you'll miss and it, it'll be very frustrating for you. So if you can just put the, this part of your finger there and pull exactly straight back, don't push to the side either way, just pull straight back, slope, 
So you pull back slowly and just keep pulling slowly. And I actually talk to myself and I do the pull, 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 pull. Did it ride it with, yep. Yeah, I did it. Pull, 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 pull. I had to look to see like swimming pool. It's hilarious. <laughs> so it will do that uh, uh, for you if you if you think about that pull, 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 pull. And I just keep saying that until the gun goes off. Okay. Uh, so that helps me a lot with archery. It helps me a lot uh, with rifle shooting. Uh, some people talk about breath control and such. Uh, I don't focus on that a lot, but uh, some folks will say that you will take a good deep breath, let out about half of your air, and then start executing your shot. And for me, I just kind of naturally breathe in there, and then I just do the, the mantra, pull, 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 and let the gun go off. So if you get into too much of the, I'm going to let out half my air, and then I'm going to hold it, uh, you're going to start uh, associating that with shooting because once you hold your breath you know you're fixing to shoot and then you're getting back into that uh, target panic mode to where your body knows you, it's fixing to go off and you start uh, uh, throwing some movements extra movements into the gun if you see people shoot we used to do this in military we put a, a dummy round into their rifle and they would flinch when they pulled the trigger like the gun was going to kill them it doesn't it doesn't even go off but they're anticipating it so bad, they'll go through the whole motion and jerk in the recoil and everything, and the gun doesn't go off. Uh, so if you think you can't do that, you're wrong because you can't do it and you will do it. So, uh, so do that. Uh, so, Brad has a question. Yeah. For a comment. Uh, who? You have your hand up, Brad. Yes, I know. I just didn't hear you say Brad. Uh, oh. Back to breath control. I am opposite of Greg. Now, I don't take a deep breath and let it out and hold it, but I don't know why I do this, but I've done it all my life. If I don't concentrate on breathing, I hold my breath. Oh, that's a problem. For some strange reason. And if you hold your breath while you're trying to shoot, you get, get really hit. shaky. So yeah. Yeah, I have to concentrate just on just breathe in, breathe out, breathe in. So yeah. instead of saying and swimming pool, swimming the, pool, the swimming pool, pool, I'm saying yeah. breathe, breathe, breathe. So, yeah, and I'm concentrating on pulling the trigger and not worrying about anything else. That's the only thing I worry about. I don't worry, and people get worried about aiming. That, yeah. that'll, that'll be a downfall to you as well, because uh, unless you're locked into some kind of shooting vice or something, you're going to wiggle. Uh, you're going to be wiggling around, and sometimes, I mean, it's like, man, I'm all over this. I'm off the bird, on the bird, you know, I'm above, I'm all over this bird. Uh, and it'll mess with your mind and you'll jerk the trigger when you, oh, I just went across the bird and I need to pull the trigger uh, and you'll mess up and, and get out of your sequence there. So I always tell gonna, people, embrace this is gonna, the move. This is going to sound like a stupid question to a lot of people, but I think you'll know what I'm talking about. Do you actually look at your crosshairs when you're shooting at a sparrow? I, I look through them. Yes. I don't look at them. Don't so look at them. I look through them. Yes, I look at the sparrow and let, yes. like you talked about last yeah. week, just let the sparrow settle in and wiggle around. Try, your your brain's going to try to get it center mass. Yep. So don't and focus wheel. on yeah, don't focus on those crop that plus in front of your face. No. Focus on your target and let the crosshairs settle in where they're going to settle in. Yeah, okay. and, and go through that uh, pulling process, and you'll be surprised how often you hit center. Uh, every once in a while, you might have broke at just the wrong time, but uh, even then. And that's the thing about powered-up scopes. If you shoot at a high-powered scope, it magnifies your movements. So to your mind, you're really moving all over the place. But if you can think about it in relation to what you're actually aiming at, because like a sparrow is only an inch and a half wide and three inches tall. I mean, that's tiny. If you're wiggling from one side of the sparrow to the other, you're only staying within an inch and a half wiggle. I mean, that's pretty good. So, uh, but it looks like you're just, you know, going into an epileptic seizure. Uh, yeah. But, but you're actually, you know, deviating around, you know, in a one inch circle, which is great. Uh, so you got to get that out of your head, especially when you go up in power. Uh, is that movements are magnified. So don't, don't get, don't let it get in your head uh, on that. So we've done all of this and we got us a big target out. We got it at 10 yards. 
We pointed the gun down at it. We've got it sitting in our shooting vice or off our bags or our towels or whatever that we're going to do. So once we get in there, we uh, cheek up on the rifle. We get our crosshairs about where we want them on there and we start focusing downrange there on the pool. So we let it wiggle, 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 pull, 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 pull. And the gun goes off. We hit the target. So uh, at that point there, we're pretty much almost done with our sighting in process. Cause if you can hit that target, uh, we're pretty golden. So I don't know if we'll be able, this is one of the things that I was going to, to do was show this screen. Cause like this would be like your crosshair here. So if we were shooting at the target right here and our bullet hits down here on our first shot, that's all that we need to know to adjust the scope to where we can probably be pretty darn close to centered on our second shot. <laughs> so uh, in this case, we're, we're low, we're shooting low and we shot to the right. So all that you got to do, uh, there's two ways to go about this. Uh, and one is to actually uh, measure your distance that you were low and you measure your distance that you were to the right in this case from there. And let's say that we were three inches low and two inches to the right. So if we were like that, then we know if we know how many clicks that it takes to make up an inch, like we got a one MOA scope and it takes, you know, uh, four of those to cover one inch at a hundred yards. And, you know, it may take 16 of those to cover it at 25 yards or whatever. So we got a click. It's gonna take a lot of clicks to move three inches at, at 10 yards. It's gonna take a lot. Uh, so you can dial this thing and just always remember that the scope turret, if the, it says up, which is counterclockwise, up moves your bullet up. Okay. So in this case, we need to move our turret towards up counterclockwise, a number of clicks that will get close to that three inches. And our impact of the bullet needs to go left. So you will adjust it towards the left, which is away from you a number of clicks uh, that would equal two inches. So that's, that's what the turrets up and left and right and down mean is I'm moving the bullet impact. The net effect of what actually happens in, inside the scope is that you will move the crosshair the opposite. So when you turn it to the, to the up, it actually drops the reticle, causing you to pull the gun up higher when you look at it the next time. So cool. it's kind of confusing. Uh, so I tell people just, if it says up, you want your bullet to go up, you turn it up. You want your bullet to go left, you move it to the left. And you get to the thing where you know it's counterclockwise to go up and back towards you to go right. And you don't even have to, to uh, take your eye off the scope to adjust it. You can just stay right there on the target and adjust it. If you do that, what you will be able to see is you can see the crosshair move. So if you had one of those lock-in vices or you were stable enough on your shooting platform to where you could hold the gun really, really steady, if you did that and you were aiming right at your center uh, point, which is aiming at, so you got your dot and you're aiming at the dot and you stay there and don't move that gun and twist the knobs and twist the knobs, that crosshair will move down to your bullet hole. Oh. And when it does that, you're sighted in. You're zeroed. Your next shot will be so close. And then you can move off to your other distances that you want to shoot. So you can actually do that if you can hold the rifle on your second one. There are actually scopes out there now that have two crosshairs in them. And you, when you want to sight it in, the one crosshair will stay on target and you'll move the other crosshair down until it's on there. And then that re-zeroes your scope down to that one. So uh, you can always keep that one crosshair on your thing. Even if you're wiggling, you can get back on it and keep adjusting until the second crosshair goes on your bullet hole and you're sighted in. Even if, so you're really close on that one. So uh, lots of nifty things out there, but that is a very quick way to be able to uh, zero your scope. You either go by distance and move it, or you can do that method there if you can hold the gun steady enough while you adjust it. Uh, you can even have, like Danielle, I can have her if I wanted to. I can hold the scope steady and on there and hold it and don't move it. And she can dial the scope for me if, and tell it, whoa, you know, if I wanted to. So you can have her help her. 
so that's what I do there. So awesome. Now, so that part there, if you're at 10 yards, you're going to want to go further than 10 yards. I can promise you that. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about bullet trajectory because this is something that a lot of people don't think about or realize when it comes to shooting. Uh, so on your gun, you have your scope sets up here. So your line of sight is through the scope in a straight line. So you can do things like uh, put a base on there that angles your scope down a little bit and things like that, but you're still looking through the scope in a straight line out in front of you. So when you shoot a bullet, it starts dropping out of the barrel immediately when it leaves. Gravity starts on it immediately. So what happens for you to be able to shoot down there to get the sparrow, you have to aim the gun upwards like this. So now what you have is a scope that's level and a barrel that's upwards like this. So the net effect of what happens to this is that your bullet is gonna take off, it's gonna go up until gravity wins and then it's gonna start coming back down. Uh, so this has the effect on your trajectory on your bullet is that you will actually have two zeros, not just one. So you will be dead on in two different distances, not just one. So people think that if you shoot at 40 yards, you're, you're just good at 40 yards, but that's not correct. You're actually good at two distances. So in the case of like my Marauder, which shoots around 850 foot per second with the pulse I got in it, then uh, if I sighted in at 40 yards, which sounds like a long ways, but for me, it's that's my first birdhouse is 40 yards uh, from where I'm sitting now. If I sight in at 40 yards, it will actually be on at 16 yards, 15, 16, it will be on. So the bullet will go through at that distance. And then in between, in between the 15 and the 40, I'll actually be high. So if I shoot at something that at 30 or 25, I actually have to shoot under it to get it. Not at it, not over it, but under it because the bullet was still rising and it'll have what they call a zenith or a peak in the middle of the arch. So I will actually be high at 27 yards. Uh, so that's where its max peak is, is 27 yards. So at 27 yards, that'd be the highest the bullet will travel and then it'll come back down and it'll go right back through at 40 yards and I'll be on zero again. So in that case, if you have a birdhouse at you know, 15 yards and you had one at 40 yards, you would aim exactly the same at 15 yards as you would at 40 yards and you'll hit the bird both times without making any kinds of adjustments whatsoever. But if that bird was at 27 yards and you aimed right at it, you will shoot over it. Wow. When you get beyond 40 yards and you're at 50 and 60, now you got to hold over the, the target or you won't hit it, you'll shoot under it. And the further out you go, the more drastic this drop becomes. Uh, your bullet destabilizes, it gets slower and it will drop faster and faster and faster and faster. And that's why if you're shooting out at, at some point there within a couple of hundred yards, your pellet's in the ground. Uh, so and if you're shooting level, it's even quicker than that, that it's going to hit the ground. So you keep that in mind when you're shooting that a, that a 22 caliber pellet at 850, 900 foot per second. If you shoot at about 29 degree angle in the air, that's, a, that's the optimum angle for it to go the furthest it can. And it, it can easily go 300 yards. Wow. So if you're in a, if you're in a neighborhood shooting up, you, you know, I mean you're talking down a city block. It, it, it could drop back down, you know, a city block away. So you got to be really careful uh, about that sort of thing. So if you're in a, a place where there's people close to you, then I kind of uh, recommend doing like Brad and baiting birds, getting them on the ground and shooting them off the ground. Uh, so that helps a lot. To, and if you got a wooden fence or something, you can actually put up a bait station in the backstop and, and yeah. shoot and be safe. Yep. So, That's excellent. Yeah. Uh, Greg, I, I have a question. I have my gun sighted in at 25 yards for my mm -hmm. Gore-Tex. Yes. So they're at 75 feet. Um, I have a tree swallow house that's about 110 feet total from where I shoot. So another, right. so what would that be? Another 20? 33, 30. 35 yards, 36 yards. That'd be total 36 yards, right? Mm -hmm. So to hit that sparrow that lands on my tree swallow box, 
I need to aim just a little bit higher on him. I'm going to say that if you're siding at 27 yards with that there, you're going to probably aim his head at that distance there, and you'll take him out. If if you were to side in, because you're shooting basically at the peak, at the peak, so you'll be low going, coming into it, at it, and then you'll start dropping back down uh, after that. So you're starting to drop after you get through there, but uh, in that little bit of a distance there, you're probably going to only be uh, another inch. So it's not going to be very much. So like a starling, if you hold on his head, you'll you'll hit him in the body. Okay. On that. So hold so, it above whatever it is. Yeah. Where I'm aiming. Now, okay. What what you should do, especially if you got a mill dock type scope. I do. For sure. So what you do is you shoot your 27 yards, and then you get your board and you and you move it out to 33 yards, lean up against your bluebird house and shoot. Then you go back to where you shot from, look through your scope. Uh, you can make a mark on it if you can't see it and see where your bullet is and look in your crosshair and see which dot is it on. Is it on a dot, before dot? And if you'll hold that point on the bird, you will get him every okay. time. Okay. So you can do that from here. That's what I do from here out. So I've got, you know, I may have it, like I have this big gun air rifle here. I actually have it sighted in uh, all the way out to the very, very far end, 73 yards. Uh, so that's where it's at. So that last house, well, that, the new one now is a little bit further, but that the, it used to be 73 yards on that. But I map out my reticle for all the other houses all the way down. So I can come back all the way back here and set a target at each one of those and shoot and then make my lines on there and then come back, set the gun in, and then see where in the, in the crosshair is each of those impacts. And then I jot it down on, on a notepad. And if you do it enough times, you don't have to even look at it. But if you have it jotted down, you make what you call a range card. And you will know. And you got to, oh, he's on my third house. I need to use the second dot down. And I'll get him. <laughs> so, and to do that, you've got to figure out which magnification of your scope works the best for you. And leave it there. Don't adjust it because most all of your scopes are second focal plane scopes, which means that the crosshairs always stay the same size as the power increases or decreases. Mm -hmm. So that means that the, the dots are only going to be the same distance at that one power. So if you adjust it down from that power, then that's going to increase the distances between. And now when you set the second dot on there, it would be uh, way off. Right. So you, you need to figure out what power, like eight power is really good for you, say. Uh, in your case, maybe seven, six, something. That's good for you. You can see everything good. You can get on target fast and then map out your reticle and just leave it alone. Treat it like it's a fixed power scope and don't adjust it anymore on power. <clears throat> and just leave it be and map your reticle and you'll be very accurate on distance. The biggest culprit is wind. Yeah. So you would think, oh, well, it's 25 yards. What can wind do at 25 yards? Well, it can blow you off of a sparrow and make you hit your house easily. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you always have to, to think about that and worry about the wind. Uh, I mean, some, some of us have little nippy little tools. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> that's a Kestrel. So that little Kestrel there will tell me how fast the wind's blowing. I can get what direction it's blowing from. And... Uh, I can factor that in. So you can get all kinds of ballistic applications you get on your iPhone and stuff too, if you really want to get serious into it, or you can just uh, uh, Google it up and then write it down on your range card. So you know at five miles an hour, 10 miles an hour, and 15 miles an hour at these distances, this is what happens. And you got to be aware of it, the direction of the wind, whether it's blowing 90 degrees to your target or it's blowing 20 degrees to your target because it makes a big difference. If it's blowing into your face or away from you, doesn't have near the effect. Uh, and so uh, your maximum will be a 90 degree crosswind to the target. And at 40 yards with your 22 caliber Marauder, uh, you can easily be off four inches easily. Uh, you'll be a foot off at 73 yards. Wow. Okay. So you have to hold one foot off of this. And you can also use your dots for that as well to know when you're that 
distance over on a 10 mile an hour crosswinds my one and a half dots uh so you can map all those out as well and build you a, like i say build you a data table on on paper so that you know uh because i don't know you probably like me you hate missing yeah yeah okay so <laughs> i even have one of these that's a laser range finder <laughs> oh he's got all the fun boy stuff the man yeah. stuff um yeah. i have a question um let's see brad did you want to make any comments about you you talked about practice we didn't talk about practicing or did you want no to we didn't talk about practice um once you get your rifle set up, your scope set up, like Greg said, once once it fits you, there is no thing you can do that's more important than having trigger time. Uh, repetition builds muscle memory. Muscle memory takes your takes your brain out of the thought process. It just becomes a reflex. Uh, I can load my rifle i can load my magazine for my 22 rifle and never look at it i yep. can put my magazine in my rifle never look at it i can bolt it put the safety on i can shoulder my weapon without ever taking my eye off of a house sparrow. right i've done it greg i i, I was telling kathy the other day and i i don't think i'm over exaggerating if i go back to the time i was six years old with my red rider bb gun till today I've shot a rifle. This is not counting shotguns. I've shot a rifle of some shape, form, or fashion. I'm guessing 100,000 times. I don't yeah. think that would be a stretch. No, not a stretch at all. I've done way more than that. I guarantee it. I, and that's what I told her. I said, Greg shot more than I have, and I've shot 100,000 times. Yeah. Wow. So when I, was a kid, when I was a kid growing up, I was given a 22 rifle when I was five. So, and I was turned loose about, to hunt for the family. 1800s, right? So yeah, 1800, uh, 1867, I think it was. So, but my dad, I don't know if he felt guilty or whatever, but my dad would buy me a brick of 22 shells every week. So that's 500 rounds. I shot 500 rounds a week, every week of my life. Wow. From the time I was five years old until I left for college. Uh, I actually went to military first and then college, but uh, so I had shot at least 500 rounds a week and we got to where we could shoot uh, aspirins and stuff out of the air uh baby food jars and whatnot he would toss them through the air and i'd shoot them out of the air wow uh, and and got to where i wanted to shoot i shot long range with the 22 i could shoot out to about six or 700 yards with the 22 long rifle uh and so that's what i grew up with and and that's how we ate when i was growing up so i have shot an enormous amount of rounds of ammo in my lifetime uh so yes the hundred thousand rounds easily done wow that's uh, a lot <laughs> now one thing about practice that i will say and this is one of the things we used to tell a lot when i used to teach martial arts and stuff is that perfect practice makes perfect so don't just get out there and shoot right. shoot the purpose right. and shoot perfectly every time because if you don't you're training for your own failure right yeah. So only perfect practice makes perfect. That's great. That, that Red Rider BB gun that I yes. posted the other night, you can I'm take sorry. one of those. Any, any one of you that I can see on my screen can take one of those and become a better marksman with a Red yes. Rider BB gun because you're working on your trigger pull. You're working on your, your – I mean, it's – you're not – now, don't get mad if you don't hit a Coke can right. at 20 feet with it, but – it doesn't matter if you don't hit your target. As long as you did everything right. Exactly. Then you can't control that bullet once it leaves. Once that BB leaves, a lot of times they, they're not machined perfectly round and they fly off crooked. So don't get mad. I have, I have two mentees on our site and I were hoping but one or both of them would be on this call and neither one of them are. But they both complain about missing sparrows or missing starlings. And the first question I say is, well, have you practiced? No. Well, and every time I say, you know, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? You practice. And you cannot do any. You can buy a $10,000 rifle. And if you've never shot and you don't practice, you might as well have bought a boat anchor because it's not going to do any good. 
And you only get one shot at a house sparrow before it gets educated. Now they get pretty smart fast. They get yeah. smart fast. Um, All right. Um, we, we've gone a little bit over our time, but Brad, Greg, Brad, did you guys have anything else? Any other no, I no. just, I thought anybody have any, could. anybody have any questions? Yes, I agree, Nancy. All right, uh, Greg, thank you so much. This has been yes, very you. helpful for a lot of people. Very helpful for me. I'm, <laughs> I've got to get my cheek rest adjusted. I told Brad I've already learned that. So thank you for the help. Really, truly appreciate it. And uh, thanks for doing this for us. Yeah, you can always paint, paint me with questions when we just barely scratch the surface of shooting as it, in all reality. But I know. Absolutely. I know. We could have uh, a meeting a week. We could have a meeting a week for the yeah. next three months and, yes. and get a little more info in. But Thank you very, really, truly, very much. Yes. We appreciate it. it you're, you've helped a lot of people, a lot of Martin colonies out there. So, all right. Thanks, everyone, for attending. All right. On the forum. Bye. Thanks, Greg. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.